There once was a time before Magic the Gathering Arena. Back then, Magic had just been developed by Richard Garfield and players were still trying to find new ways and new combos with those cards. But unfortunately, most of that footage from that era has been lost to time by now. Today, we're gonna take a peek into the past of the game and show you what it was like to play Magic back then. Wizards of the Coast used to package the top four decks of every world championship and sell gold-bordered versions of them. Not tournament legal, but you at home with your friends could know what it's like to play the game at the top tier. One of you at home was kind enough to send us their collection of these relics of the past. Unfortunately, we can't claim to know enough about these to teach you all about these decks. I mean, I was barely two when this came out. So we invited Hall of Fame member Frank Carson to help us fully recreate what these games were like back in the past. Let's go back in time. We are playing with the World Championship decks uh, from 1998, right? Inside the box, we had a uh, full 60 card uh, deck along with uh, the 15 card sideboard of, you know, uh, a top standard deck from that year's World Championship. That's uh, so crazy comparing it to like challenger decks these days. Because like these were like the, the proper like 75 card list, yeah, uh, this right? It, it is, everything is there. Except it is in, in gold border uh, with like promotional card backs to signify that these were not tournament legal. So you couldn't take them to like DCI play? No, but still like, like you get the, the full experience along <laughs> with, um, you know, the, the deck list, uh, a card with information on the deck and the player and some blank cards if you wanted to change the deck or maybe lost a card. Uh. It also has these tiny cute signatures. For me, mm -hmm. from Brian Seldon. Yeah, and here from Ben Rubin, because uh, these were the players that actually took these decks to the World Championships. These were like way before my time playing Magic, and but I guess today I get to experience them. And the, the reason why I get to is actually that Ralph lent us all of these decks, well, almost all of these decks. Ralph is a very kind individual for this, because this way I can experience them too. Um, we had to buy the Sly deck, for example, on our own, but what's Card Market gonna do with a gold border deck? Uh, so what we decided to do is give it away. If you want to win this slide deck, then uh, stick with us towards the end of the video. We'll let you know how it can be yours very soon. Uh, but for now, we can get into the game. So in the finals of the 1998 World Championship, uh, Brian Seldon actually defeated uh, Ben Rubin. So the, the recurring nightmare survival of the fittest deck uh, managed to uh, overtake the, the slide deck. You. What we're gonna see is uh, like recurring nightmare, survival of the fittest, uh, one of the most powerful combos of all time, really. Uh, in fact, uh, back in 1999, the Duelist magazine, one of the like more prominent uh, printed media back then, uh, put down like a list of top 25 combos of all time. First was Channel Fireball, second was uh, Balance Zuron Orb. But third was actually Recurring Nightmare Survival of the Fittest because it was that powerful and that iconic of the time. And what does this deck aim to do with them? Because it's, it's about tutoring creatures and putting them into play. And what are you putting into play? Uh, in this matchup, uh, one of the better things to put into play would be uh, Verdant Force. That was one of the best reanimation targets of the time, like way before we had like Resol Brand or, uh, or Atraxa or, uh, or the like. That's just a 7-7 seven -seven that uh, creates more board presence uh, every turn. But I guess also just the tutor engine itself is oh, yeah. quite powerful on its own. Yeah, for sure, because you can just get like the perfect card for any situation. Uh, you can get like Spike Feeder to gain life when you get low on life. You can get uh, Uktabi Orangutan to destroy a Curse Squall if that becomes an issue. Uh, the world is your oyster when you control uh, Survival of the Fittest. And can you tell us a bit more about the red deck? This was the second time we saw Sly Battle Recurring Nightmare. But this time, Ben Rubin's Sly Deck's quick offense proved too much for Scott John's recurring nightmare to deal with. Well, as uh, Ben Rubin actually said in, uh, uh, in the coverage archives uh, back then, uh, the most amazing thing about Sly is its potential for a turn 4 or turn 5 kill. Rubin's deck has like uh, 10 1 mana creatures, uh, 6 2 mana creatures, 5 3 mana creatures, and a bunch of burn spells. A strong mana curve. Uh, in fact, uh, Sly is kind of the deck that uh, made the whole idea of Mana Curve mainstream. Goes back to 1996 when a player called Paul Sly uh, did well with the deck at, uh, at the local Pro Tour qualifier. Like as we know today, like Mana Curve is about uh, maximizing uh, the the probability of using all of your mana every turn, constructing your deck in a way to leave 
ideally no unspent mana untapped at the end of any, any turn cycle. So uh, in the finals, Ben Rubin actually lost the match. So I'm going to be trying to uh, change history here. It's looking good. Really good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get into the game. Seven, all right. Average. Yeah. Okay, you got it. Good luck, good luck. Good luck, have fun. I'm excited to be playing with these cards uh, again. Oh. Playing unsleeved feels so weird, Frank. But I'll keep. I, I, I wouldn't dare to shuffle again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play a forest and some, some things never change. I'll just play a mana dork. I'll play a birds ah, of paradise. The classic, the classic. It's a good card. Love it. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, uh, Bolt the Bird is an idiom as old as, uh, as was the game. Bolt? Oh no, okay, it's not Bolt. No, Bolt, Bolt, Lightning Bolt was not legal here, but uh, but Shock was. And Shock the Bird kind of remains true. Yeah, but it sounds worse. Bolt the Bird has yes. a better ring to it. Yes. I'll on that. I'll take my draw. <laughs> These cards are wild. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, I'll play Swamp, and then I will play a Survival of the Fittest. Yep. Now, this is a card I know from Cube. I have never seen mm -hmm. this card outside of Cube. It's a two-man enchantment, and I can play pay one green to choose and discard a creature card, and search my library for a creature card, reveal that card, put it into my hand, and then I shuffle my library. Basically, it makes all of the creatures in my hand perfect. And with that, it's your turn. All right, the creatures back in the days were uh, not as good as some of the spells. Here's an Iron Claw Orcs. It's basically uh, a 2-2 two, two for 2 with a drawback, because that's the best yeah. that players got at the time. It cannot be assigned to block any creature with power 2 or greater, but it doesn't really matter, it's planning to uh, attack anyway. It's, it's, ju it's just terrible? Uh, back in the days, this was uh, like solid for a red 2 drop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, I've deployed one of the most powerful cards of all time, yeah, yeah. and you came here with a 2-2? Two, two? I'll untap. I'll draw. I'll play a Reflecting Pool. That's still a very good card. Uh, it adds mana as my other lands do. I think I'll just cast uh, one of the scariest, another one of these scariest card of all time, Recurring Nightmare. Now, Recurring Nightmare doesn't do anything right now. You don't need to worry, uh, but it's a three mana enchantment and I can sacrifice a creature and return Recurring Nightmare to my hand to reanimate any creature in my graveyard. Go ahead. But basically you're saying that this Iron Claw Orcs is gonna get in there for two? That's, I can't, that's, that's, I can't. that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> when playing B down decks, I generally want to be playing creatures first and burn spells later. Ball Lightning is essentially also a burn spell, so to maximize damage over time, I will leave it for perhaps next turn and this turn develop my battlefield with Mock Fanatic, Jackal Pup and Curse Scroll. Yep, let's uh, get in there, two damage. 18. Iron Claw Arcs. Yep, yep. A job well done. Yep, yep. So I'll add Mock Fanatic. Uh, just a 1 1, but it sacrifices to deal uh, damage to any target. That's a good one. I, I, I can respect it. I know that one. Uh, a Jackal Pup, which was actually one of the best one draws at the time. 2 1 for 1 mana. Great power uh, for, you know, red decks at the time. Uh, it does have a drawback for each one damage dealt to it. It deals one damage to me, but you know, I'm the aggro deck. I don't care about my life total. It's very close to Ragavan, basically. <laughs> 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 I mean, 2-1 with a drawback versus 2-1 with an upside. Uh, I, I think if you showed uh, Ragavan Nimble Pilferer to the players from 1998, yeah. they would go nuts. <laughs> it's like, what? Because Jekyll Pub was almost considered broken back in the yeah. days for, for what it did. Just creatures in general were so much worse, right? <laughs> Yes. And also Cursed Scroll. It is an artifact where I can tap three and... Well, basically, if I have uh, one card remaining in hand, mm. it's gonna deal two damage to, uh, to you. But you uh, have to name a card first, right? Yes, yeah, so if I have uh, multiple cards in hand, uh, I would uh, reveal one at random. And if it is then the named card, I deal two damage. I see. So the more cards you have in hand, the worse it gets because then it doesn't deal damage? Yes. Curse Scroll was one of the most powerful cards uh, at the time. But funnily enough, it was actually originally designed as kind of a bluffing card. The designers had in mind that you would put it in, you know, a deck where you would activate it with, say, five cards in hand uh, and name Counterspell uh, to hopefully put a fear that you have Counterspell in your hand, in your opponent's mind. That, that is not how it was used. So you would use 
four mana and one card over two turns to <laughs> potentially make your opponent think you had a counter spell. You know what I would just do instead? I'd yeah, just say, I have counter spell. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been intended that way, but pretty much everyone immediately picked it up as just a repetitive damage engine for, car for decks with like a low mana curve, so they could empty their hands quickly. And back at the time, there were relatively few creatures with three or more toughness, so it's effectively rad. Like, after you empty your hand, you know, three mana, tap, destroy an opposing creature. Or if the opponent is already down to a low life total over the course of a few turns, you can just burn them out. But, you know, I'm, I'm a red deck, low curve, I'm emptying my hand quickly. So, uh, well, soon enough, it's gonna, gonna deal some damage, I hope. Go ahead. All right, I'll untap, and now I finally get to play some good stuff. I'm gonna deploy one of my forests, and I'm gonna activate Survival of the Fist. Mm -hmm. Now, Frank, why is there orcish settlers in my deck? <laughs> First, so it's a two mana one one orc. It has an awesome artwork, and it, ta it taps one red and double X to destroy X target lands. I don't even have, have access to red mana, Frank. Yeah, well, I mean, I uh, shocked the bird. But, but there are also some uh, red or prismatic lands in the deck. I'm not gonna use it. I'm gonna discard it yep. to search my library for a different creature. Uh-oh. That, so, that's bad news, right? I, I, I'm getting myself a Verdant Force. <laughs> well, right now it's not. Look, I only have three lands. Verdant Force co costs eight mana, so for now I won't even worry what it does. Mm, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Verdant Force, by today's standards, maybe not so good, but holy moly, a 7-7 seven, seven that generates a 1-1 one, one every turn? I don't think a red deck has an easy time dealing with this. I'll tap another forest and I'll activate survival again, discarding the Verdant Force. Yep. So now it's in my graveyard, basically gone. And mm. instead, I'm gonna get myself a Wall of Blossoms. Now, Wall of Blossoms is a two mana 04 wall that draws a card when it comes to play. Pretty, pretty nice. Pretty good blocker for this. And conveniently, I still have two mana to deploy the wall. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna draw that card. And then I'm gonna activate my ability of the Recurring Nightmare by sacrificing a creature. Uh, then I return it to my hand. And then I'll return this Void and Force from my graveyard into play. And now, during each player's upkeep, I get a 1-1 Saproling token. Looks pretty good. Verdant Force was just one of the best reanimation targets for years. I, I, I basically don't really have a game plan uh, anymore. And with that being said, I'll pass the turn. Yep, yep. Now Verdant Force says during each player's upkeep, and you're a player, so... I am. I get a 1-1 green Saproling token. Hmm, that's also where those blind cards uh, come in handy. I'll play Ball Lightning, awesome card, unaffected by summoning sickness, which is basically haste, but that terminology hadn't been invented yet. I'll attack you with the Ball Lightning. I'm fine blocking the Ball Lightning with my Verdant Force. Yes, it will die to the Mark Fanatic, but I think I would rather not take the damage. And I have the Recurring Nightmare in hand. The Verdant Force is just going to be back next turn. I'll block your Ball Lightning. Uh, all right. Six damage here. Yep. Finish it off with the Mark Fanatic. Oh no, my Verdant Force! Go. All right. I guess I won't get any token during my upkeep, but I will still draw a card. Recast my Recurring Nightmare. It really is a Recurring Nightmare, at least for you. I sacrifice a creature, uh, I return Recurring Nightmare to my hand, and I reanimate this Verdant Force. Hello there, old friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass the turn. Yep. Upkey. Yep, yep, yep. <sighs> Alright. Uh, I'll play Curse Scroll. Number and, two. Uh, pass the turn to you. Alright. I'll untap and then I'll get myself a 1 1 token. Take my draw. Well, I think now is as good of a time as any to come in swinging with that Burden Force. I'll take seven. That sounds perfect to me. And then I'll play another Wall of Blossoms. We already know that one. Mm -hmm. I'll draw a card. I'll play an Underground River, a card that is still, well, not played today, but still like reprinted to this day, where it deals damage if you add colored mana. And to top it all off, I will redeploy my Recurring Nightmare. End of turn, I'll uh, shock you. Ooh. In my upkeep, uh, before I draw a card, I'll activate the Curse Scroll. Will you name Counterspell? Uh, no, I'll name uh, V Shino Sandstalker. So that's three mana, four, two. It's unaffected by summoning sickness, very strong ability. And at the end of your turn, you return it to your hand. So you get to deal two damage, right? Yep. 
14. And then still during your upkeep, I'll get another one of these tokens. Yep. Go. All right. I'll untap all of my lands, and you know what comes after untapping? It's <laughs> the upkeep. A separating. Yes, yeah. indeed. I'll draw another card. I'll play a Carpluzen Forest. Mm -hmm. Now I see where I can get that red mana from. Yes, yes. I'm gonna activate my Survival of the Fittest again, and I'm gonna discard a Spirit of the Night. And just just if I ever get worried about my electrode, I'll get myself a Spike Feeder. <laughs> like my, my one hope, my goal in this game, uh, after the Verdant Force uh, was taking over, was that I could at least get you to like the single digits. <laughs> I fear that's not even gonna happen. L let's see how that goes. I'm going to activate my Recurring Nightmare again using the new Sap Rolling token I just got. So I'm going to return this, sacrifice yep. the token to bring back my Spirit of the Night. Mm -hmm. Now that one, Protection from Black, not very useful, but all the other attacks on it, pretty useful. I'm also going to deploy the Spike Feeder. Now Spike Feeder is a 3 mana 0, zero but it enters with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. I can pay 2 mana to remove a counter from it to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter somewhere else but I can also just remove a counter for free to gain two life. I'll head into combat, and you know what? I don't even bother too much. I'll just swing in with everything. Yep, uh, I'm just dead on board. Uh, this Iron Claw Orcs cannot be assigned to block any big creatures. I mean, can jump in front here, uh, but not in front of the Verdant Force. And sure, I can block here, but then uh, <laughs> I still take seven. That Jackal, uh, the, that Jackal Pub dealing a bunch of damage to you. Yeah, you got me. All right. When sideboarding with aggro decks, I like to refer to one of the most influential articles about magic at the time, The Art of Beatdown, written by David Price in 1998. And about sideboarding with aggro decks, he had to say the following. Sideboarding for aggressive decks is tricky. One common mistake is to sideboard too much. I often see players with aggressive decks bring in so many cards from the sideboard that the aggressive nature of the deck is diluted. They bring in too many cards that are not efficient removal spells or cards that don't damage or threaten opponents. It's very important to make sure that the deck maintains its aggressiveness after sideboarding. As a general rule, if I'm uncertain about whether a sideboard card would be good against a particular opponent or not, I don't bring it in. So I will be going by that wisdom when deciding on my sideboard choices. I'll add War and Thaumaturgist, which can destroy uh, Wall of Roots or Burst of Paradise as well as Dwarf and Miner to attack uh, the mana base, giving me an additional angle of attack. Now, to make room, I will cut some Goblin Vandal and also shave a Hammer of Bogarden because, well, I'm not gonna beat Recurring Nightmare in the late game. And an Iron Claw Ord. I like that the cards I board in are creatures because, at worst, they can attack. As David Price also said, while there are uh, wrong answers, there are no wrong threats. I like that. For sideboarding, Lobotomy is the worst card in the matchup, in my opinion, and by far. Uh, taking a card from Frank's hand for four mana just doesn't seem very worth it. So I'm gonna replace both copies, one with a Phyrex Infernance and one with the Staunch Defenders, which gain four life when they enter the battlefield. Gaining life, obviously great against the Mono Red Aggro deck. The Furnace, I'll be honest, it's just two mana draw card nothing else, but still better than Lobotomy, I, I swear. So would you like to go first? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the red deck could benefit. I agree. We're also playing without uh, sleeves, which was mainly because the 1998 World Championship was one of the first televised events. It was like on cable television. Was it on Twitch? Uh, no, <laughs> Twitch didn't exist yet. It was on ESPN2. They didn't want sleeves because it would put too much glare on the cameras. Or at least that was the reason when I made, uh, made Top 8 uh, sometime, uh, sometime later. But uh, I, mean, I mean, sleeves did exist. Uh, they were typically played in tournaments, but they were not as common or widespread as they are today. Same with, with play mats. Those just weren't really used. Uh, play mats. Then. Yeah. Dif different ah, times. Oh my god! <laughs> also, um, like, like we did clear that uh, we could play sleeveless with, with the owner of uh, We did of ask Ralph. Ralph was very kind and said that he insisted that the back of the cards be shown because <laughs> yeah. it's historical, it shows the time. I mean, it really sets them apart, yes. right? All right, keep. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think this is okay. All right, well, turn one, <laughs> Jackal Pop. The dreaded start that I still remember from back in the days. I mean, last game it dealt seven damage to you, so I think, <laughs> I think I'll be fine. Oh, yeah, wow. we'll, we'll see, we'll see. I'll play a City of Brass. Now that one might become painful. For now, I won't even tap it, so it's all good. Attack for two. Sure. Down to 18. And Iron Claw. Force. 
<laughs> yes, good card. <laughs> it is still very silly, but it was just the best we had back in the days in terms of powerful two drops. All right. Go ahead. Well, I'll draw a card. And let me show you the power of my two drops, because I'm going to play a Carpluzen Forest and cast the survival of the taking one off the City of Brass. Go ahead. Ah, this is more like it. Bull Lightning. Okay, I, I, I can see how this is painful. Take yes. 10. That one gets sacrificed. Nope. All right. I'll draw. I think I'll just play that right away. That's a really good draw. Um, I'll take one off the City of Brass and cast a Spike Feeder. Yep. Come into play with two plus one plus one counters. And I'll pass the turn. And with that, this returns to my <laughs> hand, right? Oh, man. The lands back in the days were uh, kind of wild. Um, well, last turn went well. Another ball lightning. Oof. Okay. Swing in. I'll just block this orc. And because that would still be eight damage. I'll remove both of my counters, yep. gaining four. So, deal damage? Yes. Down to two? Down to two. Sacrifice two mountains? Oh no. <laughs> Fire blast you. Oh, so uh, how much does that deal? Four damage. To any to Oh. Yep. Yeah, all right. Game three. <laughs> <laughs> So the rules at the time uh, in 1998 were very different from what we have today. In fact, the stack didn't even exist yet. The stack was only introduced in 1999. Uh, back then we had the batch. Which... Oh, so no damage on the stack in this, in this game? No. Because there's no stack? No, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. The batch was uh, kind of like, uh, like a stack where you add stuff and then everything resolves uh, last in first out except you couldn't add anything in between anymore. Once a batch started uh, resolving, everything happened uh, basically at once and you couldn't do anything uh, like in between so, so it's like the if I misclick on the resolve all <laughs> on MTG Arena? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, you, you can think of uh, the stack as a batch that never closes. And this also led to, uh, you know, uh, somewhat weird interactions. For example, uh, like if you at some point would play a Necrotal, while I control a, uh, a mock fanatic, I can like sacrifice the fanatic in response. But uh, if I don't, in, in response to the spell Necrotal, yeah. I mean. But if I don't, then you know everything, including the comes into play effect of Necrotal, that's how it worked, would all happen at the same time. Oh, <laughs> so mock fanatic couldn't just kill the the Necrotal uh, with the way the rules worked uh, back then. Another weird thing about the rules back then was uh, that uh, damage was actually waiting until the end of the batch. So, for example, if one player would play uh, Giant Growth and then the other player would respond by, okay, I'll Lightning Bolt your creature in response, well, we do the entire batch, but damage would wait to apply until the very end. So first the creature grows, then the three damage happens and the creature would survive. So you couldn't, you Ooh. just couldn't counter pump spells? Pretty, pretty much. Uh, things <laughs> worked a bit differently. Uh, Giant Growth is a lot better back then. Yeah. yeah. All right. I've seen your curve, Frank. I'll go first. <laughs> yep. I won't disrespect the orcs <laughs> again. You yeah. better not. So this hand looks really awkward because there's only one green source and then one colorless source and no other colored sources of mana. But it does have Wall of Roots to, uh, for early mana acceleration and Survival of the Fittest, which, if it really needs to, can get me Birds of Paradise for colored mana. Also, most of the spells in my hand are green anyway, so I can, even if I don't draw other colored sources, I can still play an orangutan or something. It'll work out. I think I'll keep this. I'll mulligan. And we're also going by old mulligan rules. So uh, this is gonna be a Paris mulligan. So how, did, how does that work? So we're playing this match with the mulligan rule at the time, which differs from the one uh, we have today. When Magic was first published, mulligans didn't even exist. There was no mulligan rule. You just drew zero <laughs> and yes. stuck with it. Good luck. <laughs> but very, very quickly, already like in 1994, uh, a mulligan rule was introduced. But it was, well, a simple one. If you drew your opening hand and it had either zero lands or all lands, you could reveal it to your opponent and then draw like, uh, like a fresh one. But you could only do that once, right? So if you're stuck with another no lander, that's what you had? 
uh, yeah, tough, uh, tough beat. But of course, if you had, say, uh, uh, six spells, one lands, yeah, it would often lead to a non-game. Like the next mulligan rule, uh, the, called the Paris mulligan rule, because it was played at Pro Tour Paris, gave us the somewhat familiar process of starting with seven cards and going down to six, five, four, and so on. But you just like drew six, that's it, drew five, that's it, uh, and then shuffled in between. Uh, this was actually the mulligan rule that we were playing under, but also the mulligan rule that we were at for almost two decades. So you just took a mulligan? Y yes, So exactly. you're going to have to draw only six cards now, not seven and put one it's back. It's really yep. painful. <laughs> Good yep. luck with that. That's actually the same as I, when I started playing Magic still, yeah. so they didn't change that for so long. And then, but, then it was Scry at some point, where we scryed one at the start of the game. My second hand isn't ideal, only one land, but uh, it has several cheap cards. And due to its low mana curve, Sly can actually operate off of uh, like a low amount of mana. We're playing under old mulligan rules, so going down to five would be really punishing. All right. I'll start things off with the forest and... Mm -hmm. No, oh, I shouldn't tap this. There's mana, mana burn, isn't there? <laughs> yes, there actually is. That was a thing back then, yeah. I, I don't have a Birds of Paradise, so I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to leave this on tap. Go ahead. Smart. <laughs> Well, it worked well last game. <laughs> Jacklepup. Go. All right, all right. I'll draw. I'll play a legendary land, Volrath's Stronghold. Now, it adds colorless mana, or it puts a creature from my graveyard on top of my library for one black and one colorless. Sure thing. Or rather, one generic. I'll tap both of my lands to cast a Wall of Roots. Now, Wall of Roots also still played in modern magic. Well, mm -hmm. these days a bit less. It's a two mana 05, and I can put a minus zero, minus one counter on it to generate one green mana, but only once per turn. But with that being said, it's your turn. So I could add Mock Flunkies to the board, but actually I'm just gonna use my burn spells to take down the Wall of Roots, just in the hope that uh, Yamin has a land light draw. And perhaps also with the, the Wasteland in my hand, I can, uh, I can really keep him off of, uh, off of mana. The Mock Flunkies can come down sometime on, uh, on the next turn, but uh, let's see if kind of a mana denial strategy uh, could work. Take with the Jack of Pop. Um, I mean, you told me that Lightning Bolt is not legal in this format, so I will block with this Wall of Roots. I don't think I can afford to Well, take there's Incinerate damage. in the deck. Well, I'm fine with trading with that. Okay. I know blocking with the Wall of Roots seems weird because it opens up a potential trade with an Incinerate, but at that point it's still traded for a card and two damage in combat, and I don't think I can turn that kind of trade down if I'm worried about my life total. Well, there's no uh, no Lightning Bolt, but I'm still gonna take you off some uh, some mana. Shock. More traumatic. Oh Bing wow, it. that is... Gone. Whew. Out of here. That is a big trade for Wall of Roots. Yep. Go. I'll untap, I'll draw. Yeah, I guess I'll just play another forest and cast a Wall of Blossoms instead. Also wall, but just draw a card rather than generating more mana. Go ahead. All right, uh, take Jacob up. I'll, I'll, co I'll continue blocking with my walls. Fair, fair. Uh, Curse Scroll, we've seen that one, and Mock Flunkies, which is a 3-3 for two mana. Which, as you can imagine, after seeing the Iron Claw Orcs, is just completely overpowered <laughs> as that for the time. But uh, it does have a drawback. It cannot attack or block alone. It needs... Yep. I'll untap. And I'll draw. I'll play an Uktabi Orangutan, which destroys an artifact when it comes into play. I'll pick that one. Damn it. And then I'll also play a Gemstone Mine. It enters with three counters, and I can tap it for any kind of mana, but it removes a counter every time, and at zero counters, it gets sacrificed. Now, this wall is not doing any attacking, so it's your turn. New scroll. Yet another scroll. Ouch. Uh, Wasteland. I'll just take you off of black mana or whatever color you might need. That is very annoying. So how does Curse Scroll work when you don't have any cards in hand? There is no named card, so it, it would not be able to deal you, any damage. You, you do need a card in hand. So I see. Yeah. Go. All right, well, that Curse Scroll certainly is scary. I'll untap, and I will draw. I have blue, black, and white spells in my hand, and green mana available. Who thought it was a good idea to put a colorless land into this deck? I, I don't know. I just, ah. 
I'll tap two and cast a survival of the fittest. Yep. And I'll pass the turn back to you. I'll take out the W orangutan. Uh, I'll name Bull Lightning. Oh man, that's a lot of damage. So this one dies. Take with these two. And I guess I'll block here. So I take two. Yep. Wait, this was first blood? I think so. So many walls. <laughs> <laughs> so many walls. <laughs> Go. Tap my forest uh, and discard Trade Wind Rider. Mm. We don't really want to know what it does. It's it's a weird card. And I'll search my library for any other creature. Yep. I'll get myself another orangutan because yep. that cursed scroll is looking really scary. And then I'll move into my turn. Yep. I'm tapping. Maybe I can draw another land. <laughs> oh no. I mean, it's fine. It's a land. It's a forest. Yep. You might guess what's going on. Anyways, I'll cast the orangutan mm -hmm. and I'll take out that curse scroll. And the turn is yours. Alright, we'll leave with Bull Lightning. I knew about that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the one downside of Curse Scroll gives away a little bit of information, but there they come. Yeah, I guess the Wall of Blossoms will just block the Mog Flunkies. Mm -hmm. And I'll take six. At end of turn, I think I have to start uh, making use of that survival again, discarding a Nectar. Mm -hmm. And instead getting myself uh, Birds of Paradise. I'll untap. Yep. And I'll take my draw. Ooh. This is a card I haven't seen yet. Cast the Birds of Paradise. You got it. And then, uh, I haven't played with this card in a while. Uh, I'll cast a Scroll Rack. Mm. Now, Scroll Rack is a two mana artifact uh, that I can activate for one mana to choose any number of cards in my hand, so up to two, and set those cards aside, then draw an equal number of cards. And then I put those cards that I set aside on top. I'll just pass the turn. It does have great synergy with the survival of the fittest, of course. Uh, you know, tuck away, use those cards, shuffle the deck, get some fresh ones in return. Yeah, absolutely. All right, here's Viachino Sandstalker. Uh, so 4-2, uh, that can attack this turn. And, and end of turn after return it to my hand. Okay, that's kind of scary. Um, well, it basically gives... Uh, a reliable friend for the flunkies, then I can attack with everything. Yeah, I guess I really don't want to take the damage off of the Sandstalker, although it does kind of bind your mana. Nah, I'd rather uh, have it like this. So I take two, Yep. down to ten. Yes. And then both of these die. Go. At end of turn, I'll activate my scroll rack mm -hmm. to set aside these two cards. Yep. And then put two others into my head, and then I'll stack these back on top. I'll untap, and during my upkeep, I won't do anything. I think I'll just okay. be glad with what I have. My life total is still relatively stable, and Spike Feeder contributes to the stability quite a bit, because otherwise I might have to be worried about like chained ball lightning and fire blasts or something. But as it stands, I always have this safety cushion. All right, I'll play a Carpluzen Forest, and I will, yeah, this makes sense. I'll activate Survival of the Fittest, discarding Man of War. Man of mm -hmm. War, great card. We know it, it's great and limited, but right now, maybe not the play. Had it with these walls. Yeah, instead I'll get myself a Wall of Blossoms because <laughs> that one has been really good so far. I'll cast it. Yep. Uh, drawing yet another card. And then to add even more to the board, I'll cast a Spike Feeder. <sighs> Entering with two plus one plus one counters. And then that's your turn. <laughs> You're setting up like a real pillow fort here. I am. <laughs> like how, how am I supposed <laughs> to get through this? Go. Oh, I love to hear that. I'll untap. I will take my draw. I'll activate my scroll rack. I, I don't like what I see. So I'll put two mm -hmm. cards on top. Yep. And, oh, I guess I put them aside. I see my new cards and then I get to see what I put here. I'll play an underground river. And I'll pass the turn. All right. Okay, we got a ball lightning. Okay. I'll send everything. So I think I'd like the board to be as clean as possible. So I'm gonna block with the spike feeder here. I'm gonna block with the wall of blossoms here and another wall of blossoms there. And then before damage, I'll remove one counter off the spike feeder, gaining two. Yep. 
Uh, damage, I trample for two. Yep, I go back down to ten. Uh, I take one from the pup. <laughs> oh, yes, you do! Your first blood, yes. <laughs> 19. These die. Uh, yep. Go ahead. So still during your end step, I'll activate the stronghold. Aye, um, aye. I, I didn't think I would get to this point, but uh, <laughs> here we are. I'll put Trade Wind Rider back on top of my library. I'll untap, draw this, and for the first time, I will actually cast it. Yep. Trade Wind Rider. Now, it's a 1 4 flyer, which doesn't seem very powerful for 4 mana, but I can tap it and two other creatures I control to return target permanent to its owner's hand. This is your permanence or mine. I'll still play this reflecting pool. Yep. Go ahead. Well. Go. Perfect. I'll activate the stronghold and I think I'll just put a spike feeder on top. I'll untap. I'll draw the spike feeder, play a spike feeder, mm -hmm. and just with two counters. And yeah, I think for now that's just my turn. I'll leave it there. Whoa, it's a jackal pup. Oh, <laughs> go. Use the stronghold to put a mana war on top of my library, I guess. And then also I'll tap the rider and both of these to return my wall of blossoms. Yep. So this is in my hand, and I'll move into my turn. So I draw this, and I'll start off my turn by casting said Wall of Blossoms. So I draw another card. Are you enjoying the deck? Yeah, right now. <laughs> like this situation, much more enjoyable than the one yes. last game. Play a forest, can't have too much mana, uh, and activate survival. I'll get myself a Spike Weaver. You already know what it does. I'll let the viewers know what it does in a second. Yes. Uh, Spike Weaver is similar to Spike Feeder, where it enters with an amount of plus one plus one counters, in this case three. For two mana, I can remove one to put one somewhere else, just like Spike Feeder. And for one mana, I can remove one to basically fog, which means that creatures don't deal combat damage this turn. And with that being said, I'll pass the turn to you. I remember being uh, locked via Trade Wind Rider and Spike Weaver because uh, you would just fog twice, bounce the weaver to hand, yeah. keep doing it. it. It was just impossible to get through. Still don't really have good attacks. We have another jackal pup. Uh, go. At end of turn, I'll activate the spike weaver to remove one here. and put, put one here instead. Yep. And then I think I'll gain four off the spike feeder, you know, just to get myself comfy. And then I will bounce this wall of blossoms to my hand. I'll untap, I'll take my draw. I will activate Survival of the Fittest, discarding a Birds of Paradise. Mm -hmm. And we already know this one from game one, it's a Verdant Force. Yep. However, this time, I'm not gonna cheat it into play like I did that time. Instead, I'm just gonna tap seven, eight mana <laughs> for this good old seven, seven. And with that, I'll pass the turn. Mm -hmm. Upkeep. Yeah, this feels absolutely hopeless. <laughs> I can't even say anything to cheer you up, Frank, because I agree. Uh, we got, uh, along with this, four of a kind. Oh, yeah, that's uh, quads. I claim victory. I, I can't even show you a royal <laughs> flush. <laughs> Go. At the end of turn, I bounce my own spike feeder. That works. Just to, you know, maybe gain some more life. Go. Get another sapling. Uh, recast the spike feeder, which enters with two counters. <laughs> How am I supposed to beat this? <laughs> and attack with the verdant force. <laughs> Look at my blockers. <laughs> uh, they're not the best blockers for this, no. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just gonna try. Oh, everything in front of the verdant Unfor force. Unfortunately, I have so much mana. This is six mana. I'll remove two counters here and move them there. Yep. And then I'll do the same for one here, mm -hmm. move it here. So this becomes a 10-10. Yep. And that's a mere nine power you have there. So the Verdant Force even survives. I'll deal three and then the rest here. No need. Uh, sure. So, well, everything dies. And uh, you take seven? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no problem there. And then it's your turn. Well, at least Oh no! this one is going down. I'll bounce it. I like my Verdant Force. 
fine. Yep. Uh, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I go. <laughs> go. <laughs> I'll untap. Yeah, you got this one. I'll attack with everything. Sure. And then I'll tap all my lands to recast the Verdant Force. Your turn. Yes. I get another sapling. Yeah, it's like even if you didn't even have the Tradewind Rider to save it, you would have just put it back on top yeah. with Volat Stronghold. Like when this deck is uh, doing its thing, it is just in full control. Yeah. There, there, there's just no way for me to... Uh, well, at least I can, uh, you know, incinerate you. That's a fitting final move. I, I, I agree. I'll untap <laughs> and I'll attack with everything. Good game, Jamin. Good game. Yeah. I think I need to study up more. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe you should learn a bit more from this official strategy guide, the color illustrated guide to winning play. But then again, I didn't read that either and my game turned <laughs> out just beautifully. Holy moly, are these cards powerful. Like, oh, yeah. oh my goodness, survival of the fittest is... When your deck really starts to do all of its things, it is so hard to stop. Like all the recursion loops, uh, it was... Uh, I, I felt so powerless uh, near, near the end. Having access to every creature in your deck, every turn, mm -hmm. just feels, it just feels so bonkers. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. I mean, and, and even if I get rid of it, like I was able to like take down a Verdant Force at some yeah. point, but I don't know, it just comes back yeah. from the graveyard. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> but still, it was like a really fun uh, trip down memory lane. So much nostalgia, for, at least for me, when I see all of these old uh, old cards and just re-evaluating really stuff like like Iron Claw Orcs uh, that were played heavily at the time with like the knowledge of today. Yeah, looking the, back, it seems so bad. Yeah, right? the creatures oh, were man. so bad, but but the spells, who like Fire Blast in particular. Yeah. I like I, I I was really happy that I got like the turn four kill at yeah. some point uh, through through Spike Feeder even. Yeah, I was, I was impressed. But, uh, that deck is really optimized for the early turns of mm -hmm. the game, and it is cool to play with cards from back then, because back then I didn't get to do it. If you too want to get to cast these spells, if you want to fire blast uh, your friend, then I've good news. I have got good news for you because you can win this very mono red slide deck that Frank Carson just piloted right here in the studio uh, by going down into the comment section below. There will be a linked comment, right, a pinned comment leading to Card Market Insight, where you can leave a comment with your Card Market profile, and we'll pick one of those comments at random to win the deck, right? And we'll ship it right to your door because we don't really need it at the card market offices. <laughs> um, so please do follow that pinned comment below. In the meantime, where can people find you if they want to see more of the Frank, of the inside of your brain, <laughs> maybe some of your hottest takes? Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, I'm mostly on Twitter, uh, where you can find me. Uh, I've also started uh, some posts on Instagram. Maybe I'll start a YouTube channel uh, I, at some I, point. I, I, uh, I do have seen some Frank Carson traveling pictures, and those yeah. were pretty good. I mean, like for, for a long time, the motto of the Pro Tour was uh, play the game, see the world. Indeed. And I, and I love that. Uh, yeah, it is It is very nice, even though often you just see the inside of a convention center. But for now, we'll see you in the next video.